Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Facebook and Twitter live session about the launch of a new trial to treat patients with COVID-19. I'm Francis Collins, the NIH director, wearing a very nice mask. I hope you've noticed here saying NIH research keeps us safe. But I happen to be safe right now. I'm more than six feet away from anybody else in the room here on the NIH campus, so I'm going to take my mask off and say a little bit about what we're going to talk about here. I'm really glad that you all have joined, and there will be a chance for you to pose questions. So please, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. We're here to tell you about the launch of a trial that is going to figure out what we ought to be able to do to save lives from COVID-19 from a particular complication, which is the formation of blood clots, which we have learned this virus called SARS-CoV-2 is particularly nasty at creating as one of its consequences. And we want to do everything we can uh, to block the bad outcomes that might otherwise happen. And so we're launching this trial called ACTIVE-4 that we're going to tell you about and take your questions. Just a quick word about ACTIVE, and then I'm going to pose some questions of my own uh, to Dr. Gary Gibbons, who's going to be the main spokesperson. Uh, Gary is the director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. He's a cardiologist, a physician, a respected researcher, and he's been the driving force behind getting this particular trial designed and now underway. What is ACTIVE? ACTIVE is a public-private partnership that got started in a big hurry back in April when we knew we really had to get everybody together to come up with the best possible ways to intervene with COVID-19. It now involves no less than 20 companies, uh, multiple NIH institutes, the FDA, the CDC, ABARDA, the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, it's everybody who has a stake in this, all managed by the foundation for the NIH. And basically, it has been possible through ACTIVE to look across the whole landscape of what we need to be doing in terms of therapeutic interventions to save lives and prioritize the ones that have the greatest chance of being successful. And this is now ACTIVE 4. We could tell you, but we don't have time about ACTIVE 1, 2, and 3. But today, it's about Active 4, which is aiming at this issue about blood clotting. So without further ado, I'm going to start off with asking questions. But as you begin to send some, I'll go away from my list, and I'll go to the list coming uh, to us uh, through the internet. So first question, uh, Dr. Gibbons, what exactly is Active 4, and what is an antithrombotic, and why would you want to put that into a trial to try to help people with this disease? Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Francis. Uh, Active 4 is, as you mentioned, one of the high priority protocols being pursued uh, by the Active Partnership, uh, in which our real goal is uh, obviously to, to reduce uh, the uh, uh, complications and, and deaths due to COVID-19. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as we've prioritized and learned about this virus, one of the observations that clinicians made very early on is that many of the patients who died uh, when the autopsies were performed and they were uh, studied and examined carefully uh, saw lots of blood clots, more than you would normally anticipate from people who are sick in a hospital. And so uh, this uh, raised the notion that this novel virus was causing complications in ways that uh, your typical viral infections don't. Uh, and uh, that raised a concern that uh, obviously these blood clots contributed to the high death rates. And if, if perhaps we could figure out what's driving this blood clotting and prevent it, mm. maybe in indeed we could uh, reduce the death toll from COVID-19 mm -hmm. as well as prevent some of the complications where an organ damage that are created by blood clots like strokes and heart attacks and blood clots to the lungs. Uh, and so uh, that's really what ACTIVE is designed to do. It's trying to figure out who is, is it most important to give these treatments to, to thin out their blood, reduce the likelihood they're going to find, uh, a, to develop a blood clot that will cause problems. Uh, what is the right drug that will affect the clotting system in just the right way to uh, benefit the patient? but not cause other complications? Uh, what is the right dose or intensity of treatment uh, that we ought to, to give? Uh, and, uh, and what's the best setting, whether it's before people come in the hospital, while they're in the hospital, or while they're recovering uh, from the COVID infection? 
These are the series of questions that these trials will, will try to examine, because right now, clinicians really don't know what's the best approach to, to uh, again, reduce the death rate uh, and to uh, prevent some of these complications uh, in the sickest patients. So you mentioned this is an unexpected consequence of this particular coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, because we don't see, at least not usually, this kind of propensity to clotting from other respiratory viruses like influenza. Uh, Gary, do we have any idea how this happens, what the mechanism would be? Why should this virus have this additional really dangerous property, uh, not just in the lungs, but in other parts of the body as well? How does that work? Yeah, no, it, it, it was something that was quite striking, uh, and it really uh, tells us that we still have a lot to learn about this novel coronavirus. Uh, it was really some observant clinicians that were starting to see this deviation from, you say, of what they usually see in people with a pneumonia. Uh, and uh, one of the, the elements uh, of this, um, this disorder uh, is that it was also surprising that um, there were blood clots both on the what's called the arterial side, the side of the circulation that uh, has oxygenated blood that feeds the organs, as well as the venous side that ordinarily uh, drains blood from the body and takes it to the lung. The blood clots were happening on both sides of the circulation, and they were happening in the largest vessels as well as the tiniest vessels. So this was very unusual, uh, and it was probably happening at, at least twice or three times as frequently than you'd normally see in, say, critically ill patients uh, mm -hmm. develop complication. Uh, we're still sorting out precisely why this is happening, uh, but one of the things the early uh, hypotheses and clues is that in order for the virus to infect us and infect our cells, it's got to get entry. It's got to kind of have a key that opens up the door to the cell to get in. And, and those key and, and, uh, and, and locked mechanisms, if you will, they, those are on certain specific cells in the body. And one of the, mm -hmm. the areas that the, attaches, the, the virus attaches to is the lining of the blood vessel, uh, the, the endothelial cells. Uh, and it's really the, the, the lining of the blood vessels that's really meant to be kind of your Teflon coating, if you will, for your, your, your blood vessels. That's what keeps blood normally moving through your circulation freely and actually prevents things from sticking and causing clots. Well, there appears to be something about how this virus gets into that lining and injures it that perturbs that balance and increases the likelihood and propensity to form those blood clots. That's the current working hypothesis, and that's where this active forward protocol will try different treatment regimens to try to reduce the likelihood of that happening. So somebody from Facebook who's uh, pretty sophisticated asking a question, which part of the clotting cascade is the virus affecting? Wow, that is a terrific question. And so- <laughs> We don't know um, the answer, but we are working on it, right? Go ahead. <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, <laughs> so so uh, uh, that, that is something that we're, we're still working on. And, and for, for others in the audience, you know, they're probably used to their own experience. If you cut yourself, um, it, it, immediately the blood will sort of pour out like it's water or liquid, uh, but gradually uh, it starts to get thicker and thicker uh, to the point that, again, a seal is created and a clot forms. And that's created by uh, these proteins uh, called fibrin that form a net, literally, and start to, to mend up that, that, that hole in the blood vessel. Uh, and part of what forms a clot is not only that net of the fibrin proteins, but these cells called platelets that, that uh, sort of um, um, are fragments that get caught in the net, and that really seals um, that, that whole clot. Uh, so it's the combination of the, the, the rope-like fibrin proteins and these little particles called platelets. And so that really, uh, th those two parts of the clotting system uh, are really what we're now trying to target and, and test whether should we, uh, are drugs that target the platelets, uh, those little fragments of cells, more effective in preventing these blood clots, and that's actually being tested in the outpatient protocol, uh, or uh, is it if we thin the blood and prevent those that net from forming out of fibrin, 
Is that going to be the effective strategy or should it be some combination thereof? Those are the kinds of questions that these protocols are pursuing to help guide providers with uh, care providers with the, the information and evidence they need to, to pick the right drug and that would be most effective and safe in these patients. So another really sophisticated question from Facebook, and I hadn't thought about this, are people who are already on anticoagulant therapy, uh, people on warfarin, for instance, or people who've been taking a baby aspirin, are they better protected from blood clots if they happen to get a serious case of COVID? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, so uh, that is a very sophisticated question. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we also want to learn uh, in this, that there have been some sort of observational studies that uh, um, indicate that uh, maybe if you're on anticoagulation, uh, you tend to have uh, 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 fewer of these kinds of complications. Uh, the challenge mm -hmm. that is that um, uh, those tend not to be what we call randomized controlled trials in which uh, you really can, can define, is that what's causing um, the, the phenomena? And so uh, clearly you then uh, have people uh, who uh, may be on those treatments and certainly because they're on them, they'll probably continue. But even still, there still may be a question as to whether that's sufficient in this context. So for example, mm -hmm. We still may have someone who comes into the hospital on aspirin. The question is, that may not be sufficient to prevent the blood clot. So that individual still could get a more full dose, higher intensity of anticoagulation, and would still be asking the question we're act asking an active. Well, that maybe helps then with people who may be wondering, if you know there are blood clots and you know those are dangerous, why don't you just start treating everybody with blood thinners? And why do you need to do a trial at all? You already have enough information. Just go for it. Yeah, no. So, so that that's one of the, the elements of, of medicine. Sometimes clinicians uh, make certain judgment calls uh, mm -hmm. like that. But what we found in medicine, uh, for those who've practiced for many years, is that uh, often there's no free lunch, that um, uh, m most of the interventions and drugs we have uh, not only can have benefit, but sometimes they can have harm as well. And that is certainly the case when it comes to this exercise of blood thinning. Uh, there's a reason why uh, that you have that system intact. Uh, and so if we're overly intense in thinning the blood, we can tip the balance and cause bleeding and bleeding where you don't want it to be uh, at the wrong time in the right wrong place. And so that's where you, you want to be judicious in terms of both when you give the, the blood thinning and how intense it is, because there's a potential risk and benefit that needs to be weighed. And that's best assessed in a randomized controlled trial where you, you're able to assess both the, the safety and the effectiveness and balance it out. And that's what then can guide clinicians to make better choices that are uh, hopefully safer and effective for their patients. Are there particular individuals that are at higher risk for this that you want to be sure you get enrolled in your trial to find out, does it work for them? So uh, one of the elements and probably relevant to this audience is that yes, um, the elder, uh, older patients uh, with COVID are more likely uh, to develop uh, these blood clots. Certainly uh, patients that have more severe forms of COVID who often also have other illnesses, comorbidities like diabetes or cardiovascular disease may also uh, develop uh, these kind of complications. Um, uh, but it's also notable that these COVID uh, blood clots have also occurred in young adults, uh, middle-aged adults, those who clinically had no predisposing factors that, that doctors would normally be concerned about. That's the nature of this, again, novel coronavirus and this hypercoagulable coagulopathy kind of state. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that's why, in fact, we want to really uh, have all comers uh, so that we know who best to treat. Now, in that same regard, we, there are opportunities uh, to, to see is, are there markers in the blood, measurements uh, we can make in the blood that can tell us who's got the most revved up um, uh, clotting system? And maybe those who have the greatest revved up 
clotting system, perhaps measured by uh, one of the tests being D-dimer, a fragment of, 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 of a blood clot that's dissolved, uh, it could tell us who should be most at risk and who should we treat most intensely. So actually that's also being assessed in these active protocols. So how would somebody find out about this kind of a trial if they were interested in enrolling or maybe knew somebody that they thought might could benefit? It's getting started now. This is uh, the launch moment. Um, where is the trial being run? How many sites are there? And uh, roughly, where are they in the country? And how would somebody find out enough information to try to sign up? Well, it's a very good question. And uh, as you know, we're, we're something we're continually working on with all the active protocols. Uh, that is certainly uh, clinicaltrials.gov is always a good place for um, yeah. uh, individuals to, to look up uh, for protocols uh, and to see where their uh, sites are, participation, uh, who the investigators are. Uh, but uh, um, uh, you could probably say more, uh, but uh, I think there's some opportunities for uh, all the COVID protocols to become more visible. And so uh, we're, we're working on ways uh, to find that so it's easier to know all the different protocols and where they all are. Uh, one of the reasons we're able to move quickly is because we're leveraging existing clinical trial networks uh, that have been funded by NIH uh, and that are very adept at these uh, same protocols and they're across the country. So many hospitals, many uh, clinics uh, throughout the nation. Uh, so it's likely you'll, you, you do live close by to, uh, to some of these protocols. And of course, they're mostly going to be running where there are patients who are getting sick. So you're more likely to encounter um, a, a site for this in a place that's had a lot of the virus spreading lately than in a place that's been fairly protected. But of course, nothing is all that protected at the moment, I'm sorry to say. Uh, we haven't really gotten on top of this virus in our country, sad to say. Uh, the banner underneath our pictures here says this is an adaptive clinical trial. So what's adaptive? What does that mean? What, what's the nature of a trial that has that description? And why would you want it to be adaptive instead of just in a regular straightforward one? So um, adaptive, it really actually refers to a couple of things. So one is that often we do a randomized uh, controlled trial we may give a uh, placebo or some inert uh, substance compared to an active treatment. Well, one of the things about an adaptive trial is that uh, we're not sort of set with that forever. That is, um, we might find that if we find the treatment A actually is better than placebo, we then can move uh, in the next iteration of that protocol where treatment A becomes the comparator, and we now mm -hmm. can compare that to another agent B uh, and, and continue to, to adapt and iterate moving on. And so in that way, we're able to, to test relatively quickly um, what's working and what's not. Uh, similarly, we can adapt if we have multiple arms. And in fact, in active four, in the outpatient, there are four arms of placebo and three other treatments. And one of the things we look intermittently uh, we there's a independent body that's always tracking these to be sure that a it's safe and we're not seeing some adverse effects uh, disproportionately in one arm versus the other but also we can get a clue fairly early on that maybe agent a isn't working better than placebo mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we ought to stop uh, that arm but 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 continue B and C and it's that ability to adapt based on what we learn as we go that really is, is part of the nature of these adaptive master protocols. So these are all going to be blinded, right? The people who are getting the treatment and the people delivering the treatment don't know uh, which particular treatment was administered or whether, as in the outpatient, it might be a placebo. Um, why do we have to do it that way? Let me just uh, press you about the sort of gold standard, which is the double blind randomized control trial. Um, that makes it really complicated, and people are always curious. They want to know, hey, did, what did I get? Why is it important to keep that blinded? Right. Well, it, um, it is important because um, if you, there is a potential that if you knew uh, that you were getting uh, that agent A that you think 
is going to, to, to work. It might influence how you treat or test for that patient. And so what you really want is all things equal, all things being similar across mm -hmm. all the arms. Uh, and in, in any background therapy, the decision to do any test, uh, because, because they're then being guided just by the clinical care, not by any hint of one treatment versus the other. And in that sense, it'll be much more interpretable that any difference is not related to any other part of uh, the care uh, aspect, which is random, uh, or background and similar, uh, but is really due to the treatment per se. So that's the gold standard, uh, and it's the most interpretable uh, way to evaluate whether something's working or not, or whether something's yeah. safe or not. Uh, and we have learned the hard way that if you skip over uh, that gold standard and try to do it in a way that is a little more transparent, you can easily mislead yourself in terms of what happened. So it is uh, really crucial to do a study like this using that framework. Uh, from the internet, people are asking, does blood type matter here? Uh, not in this particular uh, circumstance. So. Um, uh, that's another active protocol, uh, but um, uh, uh, so yes, the, the blood clotting does not refer to the blood typing that you, the, the, the questioner's uh, considering. Uh, it goes across all, all blood types, uh, and uh, um, uh, that's really uh, the, the uh, uh, this is not one of those protocols where that would be an important consideration. Yeah, I'll leave it there. And and of course, people are wondering, what's the timetable that it takes uh, to do this kind of study and then come up with an answer that can change clinical practice where we'll really know what's the right thing to do? What do you think? How long will it take to get these answers? Well, the, 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 uh, the accurate answer is we don't know. Uh, that, that's why we do the randomized clinical trial, because we don't know which one is going to work or how robust, how, how striking the difference may be. Uh, the, the more robust and, and striking it is, um, often the, the faster we might get to an answer. Uh, so uh, that's part of the unknown here. Uh, but certainly the uh, intention of this adaptive master protocol uh, is to uh, move with some sense of urgency. It's a part of the reason we, we're going with these adaptive protocols. We recognize the pace of this pandemic and obviously, you know, thousand Americans are dying uh, nearly every day. Uh, so we know that providers of care need answers as soon as possible. And so that's how they're designed. Uh, and for the most part, uh, there's about a thousand or so individuals mm -hmm. in each arm uh, that are recruited. These interim analyses uh, by independent groups are being done on a, on a consistent basis to see uh, how many events there are and whether there is information so that as soon as we get an answer, uh, either one way or the other, it's not working or it is, uh, uh, we will move and, and move that into hopefully uh, into clinical practice. Now, people thinking about taking part in a clinical trial must also wonder, what does this do to the rest of the care that I'm getting? So if I'm pretty sick with COVID-19 and I'm in the hospital and I get approached about whether I'd be interested in the trial, I might want to ask, well, wait a minute, uh, if I'm in the trial, does that mean you're not going to take care of all the other things that might happen to me? And uh, what about other treatments that we think are actually likely to be helpful? Can I still get those too? What's the answer to that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, and certainly, you know, uh, I should start by saying uh, an appreciation uh, as a research agency uh, for those who uh, are willing to participate in clinical trials to give us uh, answers to questions that uh, uh, will benefit uh, patients like you, uh, pa patients who, who who come in and uh, uh, we know better how to treat uh, folks with COVID-19. Uh, but uh, clearly uh, one element uh, is what we call usual care or the standard of care. Uh, and so in, a, in an active four protocol, for example, in the inpatient setting, we do know certain uh, drugs uh, are beneficial, such as the antiviral remdesivir uh, and the steroid uh, anti-inflammatory drug dexamethasone. And so uh, your doctor in the clinical trial 
would give you those drugs as a part of standard care, whether you're on uh, arm A or arm B uh, in the, the uh, randomized controlled trial. That will be the background that everybody would get because that's the standard of care. We know already that that works. Uh, and so this is really on top of what we already know works to then ask this additional question in this case about anticoagulation. And so uh, always the, the notion is that the care of the patient comes first in the protocol and the doctor does what's best for the patient. Uh, Gary, before we have to wind up, say a little bit about another part of this, uh, which is going to launch shortly, which is to look at the role of antithrombotics in the convalescent phase, people who have gotten through the worst of it, uh, out of the hospital. But we know there's long-term consequences in some people, the so-called long haulers. Say a bit about what the plan is there to try to test this in that situation. Yeah, no, it's a great uh, question. Uh, and and we, we recognize that really there's a whole clinical course of COVID-19 that we're still learning about, that there are individuals who uh, are exposed to the virus and have a pretty much asymptomatic, relatively benign uh, course where it doesn't seem to affect their bodies at, too adversely. Uh, and those who develop mild symptoms may not need hospitalization. Uh, and then those who are sick enough to be in the hospital. Uh, and so the protocols we've been discussing thus far have emphasized that. But we also recognize that um, after the acute infection, um, the, as the viral load goes down and you're no longer uh, spreading uh, the virus uh, and you're recovering, uh, that there still appears to be these sequelae, this re residual effects uh, of that infection. And, and the hypothesis now is that uh, there is some injury to these organs that the virus enters in and infects, whether it's in the blood vessel lining we talked about, the heart muscle itself, or the lung. Uh, and uh, because the blood vessels go throughout the body, uh, there can be these long-term um, effects. And indeed, uh, that uh, extends to this uh, coagulation problem, this blood clotting, uh, even in the convalescent phase. So the third uh, protocol is related to what's the best treatment of those patients uh, who are recovering. Uh, and it's really uh, just, I think, one in a, uh, as a forerunner of other sort of questions about uh, how we can best uh, uh, handle uh, the, the long-term effects potentially of, of COVID-19, and it's still an active area of study. So we have a lot of geneticists on the internet now getting questioned. Are there any other observations uh, that are of interest in terms of individuals with genetic variants affecting clotting or people with von Willebrand's disease, which is of course a pretty common disorder of the clotting system. Any observations there about whether those individuals are more or less susceptible? Yeah, no, I, I ought to hand that back to the geneticists on the panel. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, so I think um, one, one of the elements uh, uh, of this, and um, we're, we're leveraging uh, some of the information uh, that of trials actually that have been done in the context of those who have a predisposition uh, to uh, clotting and, and therapeutic interventions along that line. Because when you think about, for example, the outpatient, usually we give anticoagulation in people who have a clot or have a history of a clot. And so in this case, we're saying you, you have an infection and your system seems like it's predispose and a propensity should we treat you. And so that actually comes closer to the genetic predispositions you're describing. And so in that sense, um, uh, it, it's the same sort of uh, strategy, albeit not heritable, but, but again, how can we prevent something in people who are predisposed? And can we develop a biomarker to identify who those people are uh, uh, in a, an analogous kind of way? Um, so far, though, uh, we just then had the numbers. I mean, we're talking about 20% of people. That's probably not uh, related to those who have von Willebrand factor alone. Um, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> well, yeah, much to be discovered there. And of course, this is one more example of how studying rare conditions can spread a lot of information about common ones as well. We learn this over and over again, don't we, Gary? 
Well, this has been a great conversation, uh, Gary Gibbons. Thank you for being part of our Facebook and Twitter live event. Uh, the questions we've gotten have been great from the internet, and I've asked wow. some of them, but I haven't right. been able to get through anywhere near all of them, and they're quite sophisticated audience we seem to have here. So we're excited about getting this trial launched. It's one more opportunity uh, to learn about how to save lives uh, from this global pandemic, the worst one we faced in more than a century. NIH wants to do everything we can, working with all the partners that have lined up beside us uh, to try to come up with those answers and see what we can do through very rigorously designed clinical trials uh, to know what works and also to figure out what doesn't and don't do that. And I think we're making real progress here between these various interventions. But we still have a long way to go. So meanwhile, wear your mask, stay six feet apart from each other, do not gather indoors without masks on in close quarters. That's the worst thing you can do. Wash your hands regularly. Let's stick with it. Uh, we can uh, make this whole thing eventually go into the rearview mirror, but we got a lot of months yet to go. So come on, Americans, uh, we can stick together. We will eventually get through this. Thank you, everybody.